This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A-L-T-I-Z-E-N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to Matthew Brennan from ChinaChannel.co on an in-depth discussion on the WeChat mini programs or mini apps and their impact to the WeChat developer ecosystem and their impact to businesses, brands and the iOS and Android app stores in China. Hi Matthew. Hi Bernard. How are you doing? I'm good. Very good. How are you? I'm good. You're based in Shanghai, if I'm not wrong. Am I correct? Yeah, my company is registered in Shanghai. I'm actually, I'm actually in Chengdu today in my apartment. Wow. Um, here on my laptop and uh, my wife and daughter have just gone out. So <laughs> the place is nice and quiet. Yes, and I'm talking to Matthew Brennan, co-founder of ChinaChannel.co. But I think one of the most important things I learned about through a couple of my fellow guests is that he's an expert on WeChat. Matthew, it's great to have you on the show. And I wanted to talk to someone who really understands the WeChat's app developing development ecosystem and also the businesses that are built around it. But before that, I want to get to know you better. How did you start your career then? Yeah, sure. I guess I've been in doing WeChat related stuff seriously for coming on two years now. But I've been in China for the best part of about 12 years now. Yeah, China is basically my home from London originally. And I got into WeChat stuff from a startup weekend, actually, in, in Chengdu. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of startup weekend. You know, you guys, yes. lots of people get together for a weekend and you throw ideas, picture ideas, and then you form teams. And, and then at the end, you have some contests to see, you know, which one's got the best uh, business plan. And yeah, we came second in that with an idea about a WeChat CRM. And from that, it just became really clear that all the mentors, all the judges and the energy around the idea and, and the team, that it, there was really something there. And we just kept going with it. We went back, we started our WeChat account, we started pushing out content, media about WeChat, and, and that got a real following. We started doing events as well. And again, those were really successful. And we just took things from there, really. And actually, that's how you got into the WeChat ecosystem. But how did you end up moving from London to China then? Oh, that's quite simple. I just came straight out of university. I was originally only coming to China for a year. I was just like, okay, I'll, I'll come to China for a year to, to avoid getting a serious job in the city and try something new. I, I stayed to learn Chinese and then I stayed even longer. I got into entrepreneurship. There was a group of about four of us and we franchised a, a school chain of uh, English schools. At one point, I was up in Inner Mongolia. I was uh, living in the property ghost town of Ardos, which is quite a famous place uh, in, in, in China, where it's full of rich, rich farmers who got super rich because they, they discovered massive reserves of coal under the uh, under land there suddenly and overnight all these farmers became rich and this tiny little town in Mongolia is just uh, they started building like crazy but but obviously no one lives there but it was a great place to open an English school because uh, you know there's no foreigners there and everyone's got money so <laughs> that's what we were doing and I was literally one of about only three non-Chinese in, in the entire city we did well in that school uh, we sold it later on and moved on and I got into uh, doing re research and development for that same uh, organization. So I took a lot of the skills that I learned from the uh, research and development, which was content creation, which was marketing as well. And, and I leveraged that um, into, into the, what I'm doing now, WeChat. And that's supposedly ChinaChannel.co. Is that the entity that you have started now to focus on WeChat? Yes, yes, very much mm. so, yeah. So your role and coverage is mainly on doing with content and helping people to think of strategies to leverage on the WeChat ecosystem. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, so a lot of foreign organizations are really interested in WeChat now for a variety of reasons. I think we're probably going to go into some of the statistics later on, right? So, mm. Uh, mm. you know, what's happening in terms of e-commerce on the platform is really interesting right now. And so it's, but it's, you know, I was just speaking to my friends just before I got on the call here with you, uh, Bernard, like when we look at things on a very broad level, what's happening really is that the Chinese internet and the, the re internet and the rest of the world, they're not getting closer, they're diverging. They're diverging and this is causing an issue, one where people who want to jump from one world to another world, they really need help. 
They need to be educated. They need to be guided, consulted. And so that's really where, where we step in. You know, I do a lot of workshops and training around China and now also internationally increasingly. And there's intense interest globally now in WeChat. I guess before I go into the topic in detail, I wanted to ask you this question that I always ask my guests from different parts mm. of your career. What are the interesting career lessons you can share? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think, you know, a lot of people uh, talk about doing business in China and how it can be quite difficult. What I've learned over the years in terms of, of doing business uh, with Chinese that, you know, got a bad reputation for, you know, being a very cutthroat place to do business. You need this thing called guanxi. But what I've learned over time is that actually the, the longer I stay here, the more I understand how Chinese people do business. And I think there is a logic to it, definitely. You need to be very careful about, you know, relationships and how you treat people. I think that's one thing. Another thing is that, you know, in China, especially in internet space as well, you know, things move super, super fast. They move at breakneck speed. So you really got to grab the opportunities when, when they come up now. Now, what we're talking about today is one of the big opportunities that is coming up at this time, which is mini programs. And uh, I guarantee that how the scene looks on mini programs in six months time is going to be completely different. Yes. And that is the conversation of the day. We are going to talk about WeChat mini programs. To start first, maybe we want to help out. Not all the audience know everything about WeChat. Can you give an introduction of WeChat, which is by one of the big three companies, Tencent in China? What's the app about? Hmm, sure. I I'm guessing, I guess my, like most, I would say what, 90% of the listeners to this program have definitely heard of WeChat. Yep. They must have. I uh, got some understanding of, okay, it's a messaging platform. It's big in China. It's not big anywhere else. And it kind of dominates China, Chinese people's lives, somehow. It's more than just a messaging platform. Well, basically, you know, WeChat started out six years ago now. It's almost exactly six years. It started out on January 21st, 2011. And it started off as a very, very, you know, simple messaging platform. They were actually copying Kik. That's what, at the time, Kik Messenger was really hot. A lot of people mistaken. They think that WeChat was started out copying WhatsApp or copying Line or something. Line actually came out after after WeChat. But they were, at the time, they were actually... Tencent was really interested in Kick, and they set up a few teams, and one of them won, uh, which was the uh, WeChat team in Guangzhou, run by Alan Zhang. What what WeChat did is, the WeChat team is amazing at understanding Chinese users. They just got a really solid understanding of how China of the needs of of Chinese users, and the, and the platform has been very very careful about how they treat the WeChat experience. Very, very careful about how they monetize. You know, they, right now they've got like huge opportunities. They could be making so much more money if they wanted to. Just give you an example, like there's a news feed in WeChat, which is similar to the Facebook news feed. It's called Moments. The amount of, they have advertisements on Moments, but the, the ad load on Moments is so low compared to, to, to other uh, platforms like Facebook. I think it's something like the average user on WeChat will see 0.4 adverts per day, oh. which is incredibly low. Okay. Incredibly low. And in fact, every time you, you listen to the 10 cents earning calls now, they are getting hounded by their investors, you know, to, to, to push more uh, inventory on, on moments. But they're being very, very careful about the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, WeChat doesn't really feel like a, a Chinese application. You know, it's one of those applications that, although it is the poster child for China apps, it's actually ironically not very, very untypical. Of, of Chinese applications. You know, the typical Chinese app when you open it up is, is kind of like a, a mess almost to, to a Western user. It will be, you know, they have tons of, it'll be very, very colorful usually. It will have lots and lots of what we call these pucks, colorful pucks, and tons and tons of features that are kind of in your face. There'll probably be live streaming in there somewhere, all these different features and functionality going on. Whereas WeChat actually, in terms of the design, really hasn't changed that much over those six years. And it's very close to a sort of Western style design. Can you share some recent interesting data from WeChat on their user base and usage then? Oh, sure. I mean, the numbers on WeChat are just crazy. In terms of the number of people using the platform, it's now 846 million monthly active users, of which 768 
of them are daily active users. So that's like 90% of all users, are, uh, of monthly active users are daily active users, which is, you know, that's pretty impressive. It's an incredibly sticky application. That's a 35% year on year increase. So the numbers have been going up really steadily. When we talk about the China internet scene internationally, WeChat gets all the press. But what a lot of people don't know is actually QQ, which is the original Tencent flagship product. Uh, it still is uh, officially Tencent's flagship platform has more users than WeChat. And it's only now in this quarter, actually Q4 from last year is when they release the numbers. It's almost certain that for the first time ever, WeChat will have more users than QQ. But basically we can we can pretty much say everyone of working age in China has a WeChat account. Now it's got to saturation, even down to lower tier cities is, is completely saturated. So this actually gives a problem for WeChat because their numbers are gonna stall pretty soon. They've been climbing very steadily, but uh, they have to peak pretty soon because due to the network effects outside China, you know, they're not gonna take any other meaningful markets outside of the mainland. Everyone in China already has a WeChat account. Which comes to the conversation of the day, right? Uh, recently WeChat has launched something called mini programs. Can you describe what they actually are? Sure. A mini program is basically a light app that's within WeChat. Now, WeChat's had this app within app model, which WeChat is famous for, has been around for a long time. WeChat's been doing this since about 2012 when they opened the official accounts platform. So apps, apps within apps is nothing new for WeChat. What is new is that these apps are, they're actually, these programs, because I don't actually like calling them apps, mm. these programs are a very, very different concept from what's been on before. But they use uh, their own proprietary language, which is based upon uh, HTML5 and CSS, but is, is different, it's proprietary. So they don't translate over to other, other platforms. And basically, actually, I've got I've got um, a thing here in front of me that I think that who said it best was the uh, WeChat founder, Alan Jung. So he thought a lot about this. The, the whole concept of many programs comes from Alan Jung. It basically, in, in January this year, uh, sorry, last year, he made a, a sudden announcement. So, so the founder of WeChat is actually very, very famous in China. Outside China, nobody knows who he is. But inside China, he's seen as a, an internet visionary. And he came up on January, he just came up with this idea and said, you know, we're doing this. And actually, a lot of people, even in the WeChat team, didn't know this at the time. It was a complete surprise. And they took a year to work out what WeChat, what mini programs are actually going to be about. And so this is what he said. He said, mini programs are a kind of app that doesn't need to be downloaded or installed to be used. And they realized the dream that apps can be accessible everywhere. Users scan to search to open the app and they use and leave. You don't need to worry if you install too many apps. Apps can be absolutely everywhere. You can use them anytime and you don't need to install anything. You can see the concept as he described it there is, is a little bit similar to how uh, the Google Android instant apps, which I'm sure a lot of listeners might be familiar with. Actually, WeChat announced this before Google. So they, they, I don't think it was influenced by that. I know uh, I, I listened to your last podcast with Samir, who I, I think is amazing. Uh, I really respect him. But he actually in that podcast su kind of suggested that WeChat was influenced by Google, which it wasn't because uh, they actually were before uh, Google on this. They've just been in, in development for so long that they've only, only come out. It's taken them a year to get them out. Uh -huh. But what's, what's key about this is that these mini programs are very, very different from apps. In fact, you can say they're not apps. They're something completely different. They're much closer going back to the experience of the, the desktop and the website concept than the sort of apps, iPhone, you know, paradigm. So we're, we're going back now into sort of, uh, you know, uh, um, how it used to be on the desktop. And they're really built, it seems right now, they're really built for O2O -O interactions, online to offline. This, this whole concept of online to offline and offline to online is huge in China. It's absolutely huge. I don't think it's that huge outside China, but this whole concept that you can take something that's in the real world, and, and usually this whole thing is built around the QR code, right? So in the real world, you'll go to a store or you'll maybe your scan, Mobike is another good example, right? So with the bike sharing apps, you know, you scan the QR code on the bike and then you, now something's happening online where you're making a purchase or, or doing some, some kind of interaction. And so the real world is interacting with the online world. And it works the other way as well of like 
buying something online and then having it delivered to you offline. So how are the mini programs actually experienced by users? I mean, can you describe like some form of a user experience that might be able to give us some illustration of how these mini programs work? Yeah, so actually it's very strange and they're confusing a lot of people because I think people were under the impression, or at least a lot of my friends, people that I speak around the impression that these are apps when they're, they're kind of not. There's no mini program store to find them. This was actually a big, a little bit of a shock that came out three weeks ago when Alan John made his speech. He said, oh, by the way, there's no mini program store. Now, this is a shock in many ways, one for users, also for investors, because a store is the obvious way to monetize something like this. You know, paid discovery, search advertisements. We look at, all, you know, on the app store, on, on Google Play, this is a a proven lucrative money monetization strategy. And WeChat has just said, no, we're, we're not interested in that. We're not gonna make money on, on paid search. It's not what mini programs are about. As a user, what how you're meant to use, it seems how you're meant to use a mini program is by through the QR code in the real world. Let me give you an example. You're at a bus stop and you're waiting for a bus. There's a QR code. You scan, you open up your phone, you get up WeChat, you scan the QR code, up pops your mini program. Your mini program knows exactly where you are because the QR code has that information embedded in it. And the pro mini program will tell you exactly when the what time the next bus is. So you, you get that information and then you close the, the mini program and it disappears. There's no install. But the feeling of using the mini program is very much like a native app. It's quite different. It's much better much more fluid experience than a, than a HTML5 page. But you, that's the idea. You use it and go. And you don't need to install anything. It's super fast, super quick, and just all works through the QR code. So given that there is no mini program store, what is the Chinese developer community saying about mini programs? How do they react to it as in, how do they build apps on top of it if, this, if it doesn't give a way to monetize because they live as independent developers to these, to the WeChat app ecosystem then? Sure. The developer community are actually very, very happy about this. There's a big problem in China, right? So developers are actually very happy. The problem is getting users for your app. It's incredibly difficult. I mean, I think that's a problem globally. But in China, it's even worse, especially for Android, which you know dominates the market here still. You know, iPhone has about 15, 20 percent. You're looking at there's a myriad of app stores in China because Google Play is blocked. It's a real problem for developers. And I know from speaking to developers, I've got a lot of friends who are, who are Chinese developers now, they pay on average to get one inactive user. Because if you're, if you're doing a, an app, most of your users will, you, you, there's, a, there's a curve on it and you're gonna lose most of your users, right, in the first week. But to get one, one of those users into the funnel and download your app, you're gonna pay something like 50 RMB to 100 RMB. That's just not a viable business model for most people. The vast majority of people, it's crazy. Mini programs offers a uh, new hope for developers in China. And right now, there's in the, certainly since they've launched, there's just been intense, massive hype and, you know, Chinese people love to rush into something, you know, when there gets traction behind an idea, there's just an intense rush and everyone follows in and starts doing it. And I feel that's what's happening now with mini programs, which is great for WeChat, great for Tencent. We have to see, actually, interestingly, Alipay also announced three weeks ago that they were they were launching mini program. And as you know, there's an intense rivalry between Alipay and WeChat in China. Alipay is the number three app in China. It's the largest app that's not owned by Tencent. And the two of these, these two apps, uh, you know, have, a, have an intense rivalry. It is a very unusual situation when you've got Alipay, which is a payments application, which is trying desperately to turn itself into a social application and really not getting that much traction. And then you've got WeChat, which is a social application, which has done a pretty good job of eating into Alipay's monopoly on payments and e-commerce. So mini programs is actually going to really help. This is another part of the strategy. And it's actually really going to help WeChat build these O2O e-commerce scenarios. And from that, they're going to eat trying to eat even more of the into Alipay's market on pain. So I could see that, for example, if you are at a location, I can scan the QR code and you can call a DD mini app to get a taxi there. It will be something yeah. like a form of an application like that. As I also understand that WeChat also have other types, official accounts for businesses, subscription yeah. accounts, service and enterprise accounts. What distinguishes mini apps from them then? 
Right, that's that's an excellent question. So let's just give a quick summary. So there's other official accounts. So the official accounts platform, which is the platform that businesses use to interact with users on WeChat, has been around for a long time. It's been around since about 2012. Mm. And on that, for marketing, most marketers will use two types of accounts. There's an account called subscription accounts and another one called service accounts. Subscription accounts are basically for media, news, and bloggers. Uh, if you've got a lot of content, you're going to use subscription accounts. And they, they go in a little folder that's basically like an RSS feed, and that's kind of separate. The problem with those ones is they're too hidden. Okay, they're, they're away in this folder, and you have, to, you have to click into the folder, and you have to click on the account to actually access the information. So they're, they're too hidden for most marketing purposes. And then the other option is that you have a, a service account. A service account appears in the timeline, like a friend. And you can push content on that once a week or four times a month. The problem with these ones is they're too visible. They're invasive. If you push content on those and it's not relevant to the users, they're very unlikely to they're likely to unfollow you. Now a service account is actually meant to be for service. That, that's why you know that seems obvious when you say that. But actually Tencent and Alan Jung and his team, to be honest, from my understanding, are quite disappointed with how marketers and businesses have been using service accounts. Because they have these all these different APIs and all these cool things that they can do. You can link them up with hardware. You can do amazing things with service accounts. You could do chatbots through them if you want. Not that chatbots are a huge thing in China. That's often a misconception. Chatbots, especially Western media, feels that you know WeChat's got you know millions of chatbots on it. It doesn't. WeChat has very few chatbots. Chatbots are a Facebook concept. They're not a WeChat concept at all. In WeChat, it's all about official accounts, which the interactions on those are usually done through HTML5 pages. Back to the point, marketers are using these in kind of the wrong way as far as WeChat's concerned. How they're using it is they're pushing content. They're still using it as content is the core, which is that's what the value proposition is going to be for subscription accounts. But the elephant in the room with this whole thing is that the main value of official accounts is as a broadcast mechanism. So basically, marketers are using official accounts in the same way that outside China, marketers will consider that an email list will be the, the sort of gold standard. If I'm a marketer, I want to get a huge email list. And, and that means, why do you want that? Why is email so important? It's because you can't ignore it. Uh-huh. Yeah, you can't ignore it. It turns into your, it goes into your mailbox and you have to do something with it. You, you have, at the minimum, you have to delete it. And it's the same logic with WeChat. So email in China is just not that important. It, China kind of skipped email. What is important is your WeChat timeline. And so if you can push something in that timeline, people have to take notice of it. So this is the core value of service accounts, actually, is that pushing them is exactly the same logic as email. But that's not what they were built for. Mini programs is, is WeChat's way of kind of trying to address this issue by bringing out some new kind of account and bringing this uh, new thing into the mix. And it's very possible that they might alter what service accounts can do later on. They're actually, to be honest, you know, WeChat, why they took so long to, to get these accounts out, I know this from friends I have who are very close to Alan Jung and the team, is that they spent about half a year going down the road of where they were going to combine service and subscription accounts and put them all together in a folder. And this would have compl- actually had a massive effect on organic reach on the platform. So they're not going to do that now, it seems. They're not going to combine that. And that's great. Marketers are very relieved about that in China. But you know they spent a long time trying to, trying to do it that way. And they've actually spent you know, an incredible amount of effort thinking about mini programs and how to how to organize them. And they've come up with this system and they've launched it a few days ago. And a lot of people are confused, but I feel very confident that I know from the WeChat team, they're super happy about it. They're like, yes, we've got it, we've hit it. This is exactly what we want. So it'll be very interesting to see how they play out in the next couple of months. So a lot in the press have been talking about the mini apps impact to the app stores from iOS and Android, given that you actually bypass downloading for major apps. And because of the way how the mini apps work, because you don't need to install an app anymore. What do you think Mm. is the impact to these app stores then? Yeah, there will be an impact. There's, you know, there's a long tail of apps of inf- very, very infrequently used apps that make a lot more sense to be mini programs. The trouble is, there's no mini program store. You have to discover them offline, or you can share them in groups. This is the other way that they, main way they can be discovered. You know, sharing in groups. The thing is, you can't put them in the newsfeed. You can't put them in moments. They're completely blocked from that. And that is really where the viral, the viral stuff happens on WeChat. So as a marketer, 
you know, the, what you what marketers in China love, you know, the, the, this is what they all want to do is is get you know their their article or their H5 flooded on moments so that everyone's posting it on on the moments newsfeed, and if you do that, you're going to get huge traffic in China. But many programs are blocked from that. They can't do that. It's unclear how the discovery is going to work if your mini program is focused on group interaction. But the group's interaction does have massive potential. And I think it is a big part of the plan. Alan Jung in his talk was talking about how in the future, mini programs should be alive in the group chat. So if you share a mini program now in a group chat on WeChat, the good thing is it's huge. Like the preview actually takes up almost half the screen. So it's a very, very big picture that you get on there. It's like a, a screen capture of the, of the page that you're sharing on the, on the mini program. Alan was talking about in the future, you know, when you share that, that, that information on that preview could, could, be, could be interactive and could be live. So, for example, if I've got a group with my friends, we order a pizza, I right? order a pizza for a mini program, and then I sh- uh, my friend's like, oh, when's the pizza arriving? I can share that in a, in a group and live in the group, you'll see on the map where the pizza delivery guy is as you're talking. And it could probably be pinned to the group chat, to the top of the group chat as it is. So in this way, you can actually have apps Applications live within groups, something that uh, WeChat now you know, is not able to do, something that opens up massive potentials. On the- You've spoken about the rivalry between Alipay. How about Baidu, which is the other part of BAT? How would mini apps actually also impact the rivalry with, say, Baidu Search or any of the other major apps in China? I mean, I, of course, talk about think people like Tihu and, you know, all the, the rest of the other companies like Jay, Jingdong and all that. Well, I don't think, okay, going back to the, the question, I, well, number one, Baidu is not that big on mobile. Baidu kind of lost out on mobile. You know, the, the Baidu search is big on desktop and they do a lot of stuff. You know, they've invested in a lot of things, future tech like AI driverless cars, things like Baidu Waimai, so that's like a food delivery uh, platform, things like that. But in terms of time on mobile, Baidu's not that strong. Mm. They're really not that strong. Of the top 10 apps in China, I think maybe number 10 is from Baidu, possibly. It might have dropped out of the top 10 by now. That give you some idea. Of the top 10 apps in China, five of them are Tencent apps. And Tencent really is strangling the phone in terms of the app ecosystem. And what they're doing is basically using the dominance they have in social in in WeChat and QQ and using that to push downloads of their other apps in key areas. So, you know, there there was a while ago back on WeChat on Android version that I was using, there were several strong pushes to download QQ browser. They have the, for example, WeChat has its own app store in there for games. And that's been around for years because Tencent dominates gaming in China and actually globally as well. They're the biggest gaming company. So in WeChat for a very long time now, there's been an app store there that's just for games. And that drives gaming, you know, all the download. That drives a significant amount of, of downloads. So they use this these, these two apps to spread out in other areas of the ecosystem. So what does it mean for a business that are both leveraging or not leveraging on these new WeChat mini apps? What do you think the implications are for businesses then? I think for businesses, the mini programs, it seems to open up. If you're an offline business with physical locations or um, if you've got, you know, print media, for example, or whatever, if you've got some way to connect with people offline then many programs can be a game changer i think so it, it doesn't sound like much it sounds like okay right now what you can do with a mini program isn't radically different from what you can do with a html5 page yes they're a much more fluid native like experience yes right now they're really really hot and cool and so people want to try them out just because they're new but actually when you think about the logic of it you know of how they work without the all the little benefits that add up for the user in terms of the experience this can actually have a big impact. I think that in terms of, if you can get them to work in your organization, so if you can find a point where you can have an, a mini app, a mini program add value to the user experience, to, to your customers, to make it easier for them, especially to buy something, to purchase something, then you're gonna see increased sales, definitely, uh, and happier customers. So it's about finding ways where you can leverage O2O interactions in the real world to add value to your customers. And many apps are gonna be the primary way to do that. But having said that, there's another point, which is that what we're seeing now is mini programs version 1.0. When the official accounts platform opened for, for example, it wasn't anything like it is now. 
You know, when WeChat started up on 1.0, it was a basic messaging app, not that different from WhatsApp. I'm t completely confident that over the next year or two, where many programs are going to go is very, very different. And the future for many programs is likely to be AR. So the big play for actually Alan Jung in his, in his talk mentioned he, he broke out his, his vision for how the history of the Internet so far and where he sees it going in the next five years. And he talked uh, about how he believes that it's most likely that we'll be using glasses um, and we'll be having, you know, AR experiences will be ubiquitous across China. When you look at what Snapchat's doing right now, this is very, very interesting and very relevant for WeChat because I really, I, I really think Snapchat is a very innovative product. You know, in messaging space, WeChat is definitely the most innovative, but Snapchat is also a contender. And what they're doing now with spectacles is super interesting because this is obviously a play to move into AR and to move into hardware. It's the first time in the world that a messaging platform has moved into hardware, to my knowledge. There seems to be they're, they're, they're getting real buzz and traction on it. They're doing a good job. I was reading Benedict Evans' uh, email a couple of days ago, and they've hired one of the top guys from, from Oakley. Uh, Oakley. Yeah, they've hired one of the top guys from Oakley, and they've also acquired an Israeli augmented reality company. You know, these are very obvious signals of what their intentions are. From WeChat's founder, Alan Jung, it's he you know, pretty much made it clear that he sees the future being the same way. Now, in China, how AR, how messaging apps can move into AR is actually easier than outside China. Why? Because of QR codes. So QR codes are really really a fundamental core difference between the Chinese internet and the, and the rest of the world. So if you go outside China, and recently it was, it was, it was hilarious, right? I was in Shenzhen and I was, doing a talk, I was doing a presentation about WeChat and then I switched over to Hong Kong. And it's like night and day. Once you, when you're in Shenzhen, QR codes are everywhere. And when you step into Hong Kong, you know, five minutes over the border, there's no QR codes anywhere. It's just unbelievable. And nobody really wants to use them either. So QR codes outside China are a joke. People don't know how to use them. One of the ex-WeChat team, a guy, Dan Grover, who's now on, on uh, Facebook uh, team for Messenger, was talking before I had him uh, on another podcast describing how uh, he did some uh, research in San Francisco just before he came to uh, China about QR codes and was asking people how they use QR codes. And people just you know, just don't know. They were like asking, oh, do I take a picture of it? What, what, what do I use this for? Nobody really knows outside uh, China. Chinese people are trained about QR codes. They know what to do. They've been, they've been solidly trained. That if, you, if you see that QR code and you scan it, something good's going to happen. Right. You're going to get a discount coupon. You're going to get an interesting, you know, fun HTML5 page. Once you get trained and used to them, QR codes are incredibly empowering. If we move into AR, you know, that, that the QR code is going to make that so much easier, I believe, because that is the gateway between online and offline worlds. Whereas now, if we're doing it without that, I mean, I guess it's coming from near field communications or some other technology like that. GPS is how we're doing it. And you're limited in what, what you can do there. Whereas if you've got, in China, you've got the QR code, which is actually a very, very low tech and very cheap way to do it as well. Remember, like when we're talking about adoption and of new technology, usually it's not the technology that's the problem. It's society. It's people's exception of the technology that's the problem. And in China, China's got huge advantage because for moving into AR because QR codes are everywhere and everyone knows how to use them. And Chinese people are incredibly accepting of change. You know, society here has gone through massive, massive social changes in the past 20 years. But people are generally quite positive about change and they're positive about technology and they love new things. So this means China is actually able to move much faster. And I think you're going to see this, this trend play out in the next couple of years. And China's really going to be moving way ahead of the world in certain areas, not, not across the board, but certainly in the messaging space. I can see it, you know, it's already way ahead and it's, it's just that's getting further and further. It almost looks like that Facebook Messenger would have no way of playing in China as well. And I think that your point about the QR code is very interesting because I also see the same phenomenon happening just my recent trip in Japan that I think they are also like very similar to China, a QR code country where you just have to scan the QR code. And But I think the China's interpretation of the QR code is actually far more interesting that actually bridge this online to offline and also its implications into the AR. So 
Matthew, thank you so much for talking about the, the WeChat mini programs. I wish I could have a longer conversation with you again at some point in time, other things that will be happening in WeChat. And I, you will know that the WeChat mini programs is going to change in at least the next six months to a year, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, that's the great thing about China Digital and in particular WeChat. You know, there's always stuff to talk about. <laughs> that's right. And But then you must help my audience. How do they find you? Sure. Uh, you can find me. Well, the, the best place to find me is just go to my website, chinachannel.co. Um, you can find me on WeChat, obviously. My ID, are you, Bernard, you have some notes, right? I yeah. guess they'll find, rather than me yeah. spelling this out, I guess. Uh, I'll we'll put it on the show notes for you. I could even put your QR yeah. code if you want. <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. Let's put, I think it's very appropriate for this particular podcast. Yeah, yaudi.cq is my thing. Uh, I've got Twitter as well in there and uh, LinkedIn. I'm, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. So that's a good place to catch me. You can find me at blongcw or at bernalong.com. And of course, my WeChat is also blongcw too. And I've been using it. In fact, I think I'm one of those users overseas who actually converse almost every day at least 10 minutes on WeChat. So uh, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, and TuneIn, and of course, Google Play in the US market. And of course, drop us a comment. Or you have any thoughts on the show, do give us a rating, a very good rating on iTunes Store or promote us on Overcast. Once again, Matthew, thank you for coming on the show and I look forward to speak to you again. Hey, Bernard. It's my pleasure. Thank you.